Welcome to Fast Keto. I'm your host, Ketogenic Girl. Did you know that your body can actually be either a sugar burner or a fat burner? On this podcast, we talk all about how to make your body a fat-burning, fat-fueled machine and engaging your full metabolic flexibility. I'm Vanessa Spina. I am a sport nutrition specialist a biomedical science student at U of T, and I am the author of the best-selling cookbook, Keto Essentials, available on Amazon and creator of the Ketogenic Girl Challenge program. And I am obsessed with optimizing our health through all these different biohacks, ketogenesis, intermittent fasting, all of these amazing tools that center around making the body a fat-adapted, fat-fueled machine. With this in mind, I present interviews to you with biomedical scientists, physicians, and people from all around the world who have experienced remarkable results from following a low carb or ketogenic diet and getting their body into ketogenesis. So I hope you guys enjoy these interviews with this goal in mind. Hey guys, welcome back to Fast Keto. I am so thrilled to be kicking off this exciting protein series with you all. I went back and chose the best episodes all about protein, protein leverage, all of the best top protein scientists that I have had on Fast Keto. And every Thursday starting today is going to be an episode featuring one of these amazing guests. We have Dr. Ted Naiman, we have Dr. Stu Phillips, Dr. Don Lehman, Dr. Jose Antonio, all the episodes that were done on protein that you guys cannot miss. And of course, we are kicking off this protein series with the legend himself, Dr. Ted Naiman. I cannot wait for you guys to hear this episode. And if you did hear it the first time about a year and a half ago, it's worth listening to again. I get something new from it every time I listen to it. And Ted is an amazing source of inspiration and knowledge all about understanding protein to energy, which we've talked about a lot. He basically popularized the protein leverage hypothesis by doctors Robinheimer and Simpson. And he also came up with his own theory basically solving the obesity epidemic in my opinion so it's a honor to have him on the show in the first time and to feature it as the very first episode of this protein series i can't wait to hear what you guys think of it and really excited for your feedback if you know of anyone that you think would enjoy this protein series please do share it with them and we can talk more in our facebook group which you can look up fast keto podcast and there's a question there and there's group rules to agree to and you can join and we can have more discussions about the protein series in our Facebook group. I love it in there. There's so many wonderful people who have joined who are interested in this topic and I can't wait to have you join as well. All right, guys, let's get into this protein series. One of the things that we talk about on this podcast a lot are hacks, things that make our lives easier help us get to our goals faster. One of my favorite hacks is proper good soups. I don't know about you guys, but I love soup. And I haven't been able to really enjoy soup like I used to because it's hard to find amazing keto soups until now. Proper Good has completely reimagined soups and they even have a line of completely keto soups that I absolutely love. They're all made with real food, good for you ingredients with zero added sugar. What I absolutely love is they are so portable. You can either enjoy them at home, at work, or take them on the go, and they will be ready to eat in just 90 seconds. I love how convenient it is. It's stress-free without having to go to the store. It has zero meal prep involved, and it just is so delicious. I absolutely love all of their flavors. You can build your own pack or choose from their different keto soups like my favorite red pepper and meatball the broccoli cheddar is so delicious chicken and mushroom which is one of my favorites and they have a chicken bone broth as well as a brand new beef bone broth it's made from grass-fed beef and i absolutely love 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 having beef bone broth just 
at the ready because I love using it for electrolytes, for making different sauces, for so many different recipes, but I don't really love making bone broth. It's time consuming and I just love having these ready to go in the fridge to use at any time. If you want to try them out, you can use the code KETOGENIC15 to get 15% off your entire order. This is a very special discount only for listeners of Fast Keto, and you can go to eatpropergood.com and check out their full line of soups. You can build your own pack or use one of their ready-made boxes. Again, that's ketogenic15 for 15% off your entire order, and that's eatpropergood.com. You can also follow them on Instagram and see their amazing soups and different recipe ideas at eatpropergood. I know you're going to love them as much as I do, and I can't wait to hear what you think of them. All right. Good morning, Dr. Neiman. Thank you so much for joining us here today on Fast Keto. It's such a pleasure to have you. Oh, wow. Thank you for having me. It's great to be here. I really appreciate it. Awesome. Well, I have so many questions for you, so I hope you are ready to answer all my geeking out this morning with me. But I want to start out just by asking you personally, how did you first find this whole crazy low carb world? Oh, wow. Okay. So uh, that was, uh, you know, about 20 years ago. And I've always been a little bit interested in diet and health, although I was raised as a seventh day Adventist and a vegetarian. And I, I knew that eating meat and saturated fat pretty much caused all disease. So I figured that I already knew, (laughs) knew everything there was to know about diet and health. Um, so I did come from this background of a high level interest in diet and health. And then I went into, uh, medicine. I, I got an engineering degree initially, but then I couldn't get a job. So I went to medical school, did my residency and it was in my residency where I was first introduced to low carb. And I, at the time I was a primary care doctor in South Carolina and, South Carolina back then was the number one state in the U.S. for diabetes and also heart attacks and strokes and diabetic complications and just about every bad thing you could name. So here I am surrounded by diabetics and just a lot of suffering, a lot of, you know, amputations and blindness and kidney failure and all the horrible, terrible stuff. And I just expected everyone to slowly and gradually get worse. And my instructor said, yeah, this is what happens. So basically everyone gets worse. You add medication, they get worse. You increase your insulin dose and uh, then they start getting complications. And, you know, what else can you do? And so I was just kind of used to it. It was pretty terrible, but that's just the way it was. And uh, one day I had a, a patient come in and whoa, he lost 30 pounds. He felt great. He was like, I, my blood sugar is normal now. I'm not, I'm not even taking any of my medications. And I couldn't believe it. It just blew me away. And I said, how did you pull this off? You have to tell me so I can tell other patients to do the same thing. And he's like, oh, I just read this little Atkins book here. And he shows me a copy of Atkins, you know. And he said, I just stopped eating carbs. And bam, I, you know, I lost a whole bunch of weight. And I feel awesome. And that really, 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 really freaked me out. First of all, because I'd never seen anything work that well. And secondly, because it really kind of countered everything that I had been taught about diet and health. And then I thought, you know, I have to research this. And I just started doing tons of research, research, research. And that was 20 years ago. And I've pretty much just been researching diet and health ever since. That's been my, my passion. And I'm lucky enough that it's, it's an interest of mine. And it's also, you know, part of my day job. So those two are kind of aligned, which makes me really, really lucky. And that's kind of how I got where I'm at. That's really cool. I remember hearing that on a podcast that a patient had come in and had all these changes. And it really got me thinking about how many people must be going into their doctor's offices and showing their changes from their diet and how that must be, you know, a big trigger for getting people such as yourself, you know, to go, wow, like I need to pay more attention to this. Now, what made you 
personally start applying some of these principles for yourself? Oh, wow. Well, so uh, I immediately ran out and read the Adkins book <laughs> on my own. And this was way back. Uh, this is about the time that uh, Protein Power came out. And I, of course, I read that. And Dr. Eads is one of my personal heroes. And I, you know, I just read anything I could on the topic back then, which really wasn't a lot. And uh, I started employing this sort of diet strategy myself. And it, I, I was never really obese or anything, but I was horribly skinny fat and I had just the worst hypoglycemia ever. I mean, I would, I would eat, you know, cereal and juice and toast and this kind of stuff for breakfast. And three hours later, I would get so shaky. I thought I was going to die if I didn't eat something. And I was just eating every few hours all day long, very tied to food. I would just hit the wall or bonk really hard just all the time. It was brutal. I remember trying to exercise and, and bonking, hitting the wall. And I remember uh, just being unable to function almost from low blood sugar. And uh, going on a low carb diet completely cured that for me right away. And it was really really magical for me. I mean, that was a huge upgrade in my quality of life. And before that, I always had to plan, you know, how was I going to carry enough carbohydrate with me? You know, if I was going for a long run, I had to have, I had like a bandolier of goo packets and gel shots and cliff shots and all these little sugar packets and things with me. And I would just have to you know, I would have to plan it. Okay, I'm going somewhere. I'd better eat before so I don't get hypoglycemic while I'm there. I mean, this was really part of my life. And, um, you know, it, it's interesting. I, I have a sister who's a physician also, and um, she had kind of a similar experience. And I, I basically sent all this information to her and now she's like a, a huge low carb convert as well. And so uh, she's had the same kind of improvement in this hypoglycemic situation that I have had, which, you know, I'm, I'm sure there's some sort of genetic component to, to it that I don't understand, but that's really what it's done for me. And that's how I got involved um, personally. And now I just, I, I kind of can never look back. You know what I mean? Now, when you say you were skinny fat, did you know like what your body composition was or have you tracked changes over the years? Uh, the, the interesting part is I was the exact same weight that I am now, but just uh, not like a larger waist circumference, larger pant size, not as strong. And so I, I've, I've clearly just undergone some recomp and I was never really obese based on body mass index, but I've just steadily had lower body fat, more muscle, same weight kind of thing. Now, do you advocate that people get body composition scanning done or what's your opinion on, you know, we've traditionally always relied on like the BMI index, uh, right. to, you know, and I know you also use, um, a homo, is it homo IR or as homo a, IR? Homo IR is a, as kind of a, a waist or search waist circumference mm -hmm. ratio. Um, what are some of the, the things that you recommend for people in terms of body composition? And is there a body fat percentage that you think you know people should you know sort of optimally aim to be below? Right, right, right. So honestly, I don't do a lot of body composition testing. I mean, I've never, I've literally never had a DEXA and I'm not sure that that would be necessarily value added information for me. I mean, I'd, yeah, I'd love to know, but nobody has to get a DEXA. Nobody has to know their body fat percentage. Um, you know, I have skin calipers. I never use them. I don't know exactly what my body fat is. What I do pay attention to and what I recommend that everyone pay attention to is waist circumference at the belly button. Your, your waist circumference at the belly button, um, you know, in the morning, abdomen fully relaxed, should definitely be less than your height. The lower, the better. And this correlates extremely well with fasting insulin levels and body fat percentages. 
And so the, the main thing you have to be worried about is waist circumference. Weight, unfortunately, is not that helpful because I have, you know, power lifters who are morbidly obese on BMI and their waist circumference is tiny and they're just ripped and jacked and they're healthy as hell. Then I also have a, a ton of patients with this super scary normal weight obesity. This is where you have such little muscle and bone that you're, you actually don't weigh very much but you're just hugely puffy with fat. And so you're, you're enormous. Your waist circumference might be huge, but your BMI is, you know, maybe just barely overweight or even normal. It's, it's quite terrifying. That's the absolute worst. So waist circumference for me is my favorite thing to track. It's, you know, totally, uh, it's free, basically. Let's, let's face it. It's free. It's easy. And I, I never tell people, oh, you need to be getting DEXA scans regularly or BOD pods, or you need to get hydrostatic weighing, or I never tell people to do any of this expensive, complicated body composition testing, because it's just not helpful. I mean, you can know everything you need to know by just looking at yourself naked in the mirror. And, you know, <laughs> this is really all it takes. And so if your waist circumference is going down, you're winning at bottom line. Um, the body fat percentage I like for men is about 12 to 15%. I think that's really the sweet spot for, you know, lean enough to be really healthy and not so skinny that your testosterone nosedives in women more like around 20%. Um, but I, but in order to know those percentages, you would have to do some sort of body composition testing like DEXA, which I don't think is terribly value added. So I usually don't go by body fat percent. I'm mostly looking at waist to height ratio. Yeah, no, I think that's great. I am a big advocate for body composition scanning because I think a lot of women in particular go by the number on the scale. Right. And, you know, it's easy to see when someone is overweight and you think automatically, well, that person must, you know, be unhealthy or this and that if they are phys physiologically apparently obese. Um, in some cases, someone can look relatively slim, but carry their fat well and have like no muscle tissue, barely any muscle and like really low bone density and be mostly fat. And so like for, when I tested my body fat, I was close, I was at 38% and you never would have known that from looking at me and being in a healthy BMI range as well. Mm -hmm. um, and then, you know, it's just really helpful to know that just because someone looks relatively fine or slim on the outside that it, you know, necessarily their body composition might not necessarily be predisposing them towards the best health as it, you know, we grow in life. Um, but I love that you have different markers of your own that you use. Now I want to talk about your PE ratio and uh, how you came to find this and create this amazing model, the protein leverage Satiety really drew my attention when you were talking about cravings in particular. And there's a number of theories I want to get into, but one of my favorite ones is how you talked about how cravings, they, in your opinion, might be coming from someone getting not enough protein during the day. So they might be from inadequate protein. So someone craving sort of umami or savory things that it's probably because that's connected back to a lack of protein. So why do you think that protein is actually a more satiating macronutrient than other macros? Oh, uh, okay. All right. So, <clears throat> well, first of all, um, the reason I think that protein is more satiating than other macros is because we do have a lot of uh, evidence in the medical literature that the higher protein percentage of your diet, the less energy you're going to eat. It appears to be nearly linear within certain percentage ranges. The, the higher the protein percentage, the less food you're going to eat. And we have studies that replicate this in a bunch of different animals. I mean, uh, I, I'm a big fan of uh, professors Robinheimer and Simpson, these two guys from Australia who came up with the protein leverage hypothesis about a decade ago. And these guys have protein leverage models in everything from insects to fish to, you know, rats and humans and all sorts of animals. And it, it really seems to be a pretty well conserved phenomenon that the more protein you eat, the less energy you're going to eat. 
and vice versa, at least within a certain range. Um, and then what I'm trying to do, what I'm really trying to do is zoom way, 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 way out and look at the big picture. And the way I think about it is you're really eating to get a couple of things. First of all, you're eating to get protein and minerals. You know, protein comes from nitrogen, which is absorbed by plants in mineral form from the soil. So your plant, which is at the base of all animal nutrition, is absorbing nitrogen for protein and other minerals from the soil. And then it's also sequestering carbon-carbon energy, uh, solar energy being stored as chemical energy, as carbs and fats. So really when you eat, all you're looking for is the protein and minerals from the soil and the carbon-carbon bonds from carbs and fats, which is really solar energy stored as chemical energy. So you're just trying to get these two things. And then I would also add, you're probably trying to avoid toxins as well. Those are kind of the three goals of eating. Get enough nutrients, which is protein and minerals. Get enough energy, which is the carbon-carbon bonds of carbs and fats. And then avoid toxins, hopefully. And then if you, if you look at the really, really big picture, there's only two reasons why anyone would overeat. And that is because they need to eat more because they didn't get enough protein and minerals, or they want to eat more because they get some sort of reward, intrinsic reward or dopamine release from eating more energy. And in fact, that's kind of how it breaks down, right? With the protein leverage model, you have to eat more because if you're eating you know, food that's 10% protein, you have to massively overeat energy to get enough protein and minerals. So on one hand, obesity is being pushed forward by people having to eat more because they have a protein and mineral dilution in their food. And on the other hand, it's being pulled forward by people wanting to eat more, which is this hyperphagia of high energy density carbs and fats mixed together. You know, your donuts and your pizza and your ice cream and all these carb plus fat, high energy density things that just light up our brain because it's very rewarding to eat that much energy, you know? So that's kind of the way I'm looking at it. And, and the protein to energy ratio sort of checks both of the boxes. You know what I mean? When you're maximizing protein, you're, you're going out of your way to get all this protein and minerals and make sure you hit nutrient satiety without overeating energy. And then you're also avoiding these really high energy density foods, which is mostly carbon fat together with little protein. And so I, I, I kind of came up with this model as a way to, it would be a single metric that would let you avoid kind of both of those things, the needing to overeat energy and the wanting to overeat energy at the same time. Right. So you saw these studies where, you know, people would eat certain foods and then they would be able to go and add, eat, add libitum or they would go out and be able to eat as much as they wanted to. And the research showed that people ate less afterwards when they had more protein in the diet. Is that right? Well, one of the things that Rabenheimer and Simpson did is they did this huge meta-analysis meta -analysis of like 130 studies where humans ate ad lib. They just ate as much as they wanted, but somebody tracked all their macros. And then they went and graphed out how much energy they ate based on the protein percentage. And they, they had this extremely narrow line, this perfectly linear line of humans eating the same amount of protein over and over and over and over again, and then the amount of energy they ate going up or down by almost an order of magnitude based on whether it was low protein food or high protein food. In other words, it appears that you're just eating to get enough protein and then you stop eating. If you're eating an insanely high protein food, you're going to eat way less energy. And if you're eating an energy dilute food, you need the same amount of protein and you're going to massively overeat energy. And this seems to work in animal models as well. There's this, there's this level of protein, very low-ish, where omnivore mammals just will overeat the hell out of that stuff, mostly because they have to. It's a little bit of a U-shaped curve, though. Uh, there's a, at extremely high protein intakes, energy intakes is very low. At 50% protein diet, every omnivore animal is eating very, very little energy. But then the flip side is also true. If you can get your protein way, way down to about 5%, 
um, you see this U-shaped curve where you also don't eat very much and you don't weigh very much and you get really, really thin. And this is your 30 bananas a day vegan <laughs> YouTuber. You know, this is your fruititarian. These people have the lowest weights of all. You can actually get the very, very lightest. I'm not going to say the thinnest, but you're going to get the lightest on an ultra low protein diet because your body, your you kind of just stop eating because your body realizes how protein dilute your environment is. And what ends up happening is you're very, very thin, but at a low lean mass, you have very low bus, uh, muscle and bone and the weight of your organs is lower, including your brain. And it's probably not the best way to go, but it also works. So I do want people to know that this protein to energy thing if you go to extremely low protein, if you can get your protein down to about 5%, it starts going the other way. And you also get very light with very low fat mass, but also very low lean mass. And that happens to be the protein percentage of fruit, for example. Okay. So, yeah. I was a raw fruitarian at one point, so I get that. Um, why do you think that this phenomenon happens where protein – gets to that percentage level and then this energy um burning accelerates oh i don't know i don't know but, the, but there's plenty of um discussion about this phenomenon in the medical literature where if your protein gets very very low um organisms just seem to shut off eating and uh they they just assume oh wow the environment is so poor in protein that we're just going to not even bother eating. And I don't know exactly what the mechanism for that is, but it's a, it's a pretty well-known phenomenon. We've seen that you know, in the medical literature for a long time, and I'm, I'm very interested in any study I can get a hold of that documents this phenomenon. But it's a thing. I, I don't know how it works or why, and we just have to assume... Mechanism. What's that? It sounds like some kind of survival mechanism. Right. Yeah. It, I think your body's trying to save you from energy toxicity and that seems to work really well. And then of course, right at the bottom of the U-shaped curve is a protein percent where you get the absolute fattest and it seems to be around, you know, 10% protein. This is the protein percent of most of your obesogenic rat chow and most of your junk food. And the standard American diet is maybe two or three percentage points higher than that, just barely. But we're almost at peak obesity macros. Like, how on earth did we get to this amount of protein dilution that you talk about? And how did we, it almost seems like it had to be engineered to get to this exact protein percentage that would be the most obesogenic. How do you think this happened? Why have we seen so much protein dilution? Uh, it actually it actually makes sense. I think I think we it was inevitable that we end up here. I think this is I think we've We've designed this uh, perfectly because the, the way humans work. Okay, humans We have to use technology to feed ourselves, right? We're not that good at anything. If you look at the animal kingdom, we kind of suck at a lot of stuff, right? We don't have teeth and claws. We can't outrun a bunch of animals. We can't outclimb them. We can't digest cellulose. We can't dig up tubers. We've got no specialized teeth or claws or anything. Um, we're just sort of like these hairless chimpanzees that are kind of smart, right? But what we do have is the ability to think and plan and make tools and use our hands and throw weapons. And so what we've done is we've used technology to feed ourselves all the way along. So we invented weapons so we could throw them and kill animals. And then we invented stone tools so we could, um, you know, crack open bones and eat bone marrow and crack open skulls and eat brains and eat all these higher energy foods. And we were constantly looking for more energy to add to our high protein diet. Because if you, if it's the middle of the winter and you kill an animal that's also starving for energy and you eat it, you're going to get a ton of protein, but not much energy. So we're always looking for more energy, right? We would, uh, you know, eat honey. We would, um, 
dig up tubers. We're looking for energy. And this is what we've always been short on from an evolutionary perspective. So what we did is we used technology. We invented agriculture. We're like, oh, we're just going to grow all this stuff. And then we're going to try to maximize the energy yield. So now you've got hybridized corn um, that has, you know, so much carbon-carbon bonds in it. Um, oh, sorry, that's my dog. <laughs> um, now we've got this, um, you know, like corn that has so much carbon-carbon energy in it. It's this ridiculously high-energy food. And we've used technology to max out the energy yield. And we've done the same thing with animal agriculture, right? We've, um, oh, sorry, <laughs> my, my dog is- Throw your dog a bone. <laughs> my dog's causing problems. Um, so we've basically done this with all of our agriculture. We've tried to max out the energy yield of animal foods by fattening them up as possible. We've tried to max out the energy yield of plants. When it comes to plants, we go for the highest energy parts of the plants, the nuts, the seeds, the roots, the tubers, the fruit. And we're trying to get the most energy in all of this stuff that we possibly can because we just love that. That's what we've always wanted. And we just go higher and higher and higher in energy yield with everything. We grow the, the highest energy plant foods. Then we only take the part of the plant with the most energy in it. Then we process and refine that. Then we add a couple of these energy sources together. And then the next thing you know, you're just eating, you know, something that's just nothing but sugar, flour, and oil. And it has almost no protein or minerals, but it has this metric ton of energy in it. And this is kind of, it was inevitable that we just end up there using technology every step of the way to get higher and higher energy yields. It's almost like we got too smart for our own selves. <laughs> like we... <laughs> Yep. <laughs> We're evolving backwards because we created all this technology and convenience, and yet we somehow outsmarted ourselves in the process. Exactly. We knew what we wanted, and <laughs> by God, we got there. We did it. We've arrived. <laughs> now, where do you think this six meal, eating six meals a day thing came from? Because to me, this seems to be one of the biggest issues it in root cause of disease and we look at that because you are actively suppress suppressing a lot of natural things like autophagy you're suppressing a lot of natural processes in the body by perpetually keeping yourself in the fed state so why do you think is this is this related to that like that we why where did this myth come from that you need to eat six times a day in order to rev your metabolism and and burn more energy Right. Well, okay. So from a strictly protein to energy point of view, uh, you would think that it wouldn't matter whether your energy came from carbs or fats. But in, in this book of ours, we're, we're really, we're blaming carbohydrate for a lot of this frequent eating phenomenon because you eat carbs and your liver glycogen expands and then it slowly falls over a period of hours and your blood sugar falls at the same time. So you can kind of feel this glycogen leaving your liver you can feel your your blood sugar falling and this sensation is a little bit uncomfortable for some people and you can remedy it by immediately eating more carbohydrate the higher the gly glycemic in index and load the better so we have this situation where if you eat a ton of carbs and then you feel your blood sugar falling and you feel this glycogen leaving your liver. And if you're at all uncomfortable with that feeling, you just want to eat more carbohydrates. And it's, it's almost like an addiction to comfort. Um, you know, these days, if you're even slightly cold, you just turn up your thermostat. You just turn on your seat heater in your car. Um, you don't have to expend one single calorie of energy keeping yourself warm ever at all. The temperature is always perfect. You're sitting down 100% of the time. You're driving through the drive through You can control the temperature with a tiny little knob. It's the same addiction to comfort and um, inability to get out of your comfort zone that just keeps you eating carbs, you know, eight times a day because you feel your glycogen and blood sugar dropping a little bit 
but oh wait, you've got a granola bar right there. You know what I mean? You've got you've got a prepackaged snack. You know, within all of us have like you know prepackaged carbs. You know, with a shelf life of a hundred years within a foot of us at all times. Like we're never ever without that stuff. So you get to the point where you're just really kind of glucose dependent because while you, nobody ever has to eat any carbohydrate. When you go without carbs, you have to make your own glucose from scratch in your liver. And it's a little bit of work. It's not that bad, but, you know, it's, it's like taking the stairs and nobody's going to do that. So making your own glucose is like taking the stairs or doing some sort of metabolic exercise. And if you just don't want to be uncomfortable in the slightest, you just eat all your glucose all day long and keep yourself topped up. And that's why we're really throwing carbs under the bus in this book. Now, although I have to say we're not super dogmatic anti-carb, what we're not fans of is high carbohydrate frequency. So we don't like people eating carbs all day long. Even if you took the amount of carbs you ate and shrank them down to just one carb feeding at the end of the day, um, you'd be so much better off because you would have some degree of fat adaptation from running off of stored body fat a big chunk of the time. You know what I mean? So we're, we're all about lowering carb frequency, and I think that's been a huge driver of the obesity epidemic. I think that's a great point. And now, when I first wrote my book, I was all about the premise of I didn't know that you could actually choose between being a sugar burner or being a fat burner. And then when I found out that you could choose and I was like, well, of course I want to burn fat. Um, and I just got so excited and so interested by this concept. So when you look at carbs and fat, I mean, they're both molecularly quite similar. You know, one is carbohydrates, the other is hydrocarbons. So why is it that being a fat burner is so much more optimal than being a, a sugar burner? Well, so I'm not even going to say that one of them is necessarily that much more optimal. I mean, so, so for example, let's say you did decide to just run your whole metabolism off of glucose. So you're eating Skittles every few hours or something like that. If you don't really exceed your your carbohydrate tolerance and your fat intake is very low and you still have a high uh, nutrient density diet of protein and minerals, you could probably stay normal weight and be totally healthy. I do see I do have patients on a very low fat, high carbohydrate diet who are perfectly healthy. I can't find anything wrong with them. And so it is entirely possible to do that. And I do, um, I do mention that in the book that you can absolutely pull that off. The, the only downside is that you will have to probably be hungry more often and eat more frequently just because the carb stores are so low. That's only going to last you for so long and you're going to have to eat more often. So you're going to be tied to more frequent eating. You're going to be tied to more frequent hunger. You might have some mood um, issues with the blood sugar going up and down. I know I sure did. Um, I'm also a little bit concerned about dental health because we know for a fact that uh, dental cavities are, you know, just linearly associated with carbohydrate in the diet. So I don't think it's great for, you know, blood sugar stability, mood, hunger control, uh, eating frequently, low energy environments, i.e. going a long time without eating, dental health. There's a bunch of downsides. But I think that if you, if you were really careful with your diet, it was, it was high in protein and minerals, and it was low in fat and higher in carb, you could actually pull that off with all those caveats. And there are actually a bazillion uh, low fat, high carb people out there who are thin and healthy and have normal labs and are making this work. And I'm not do so dogmatic that I won't acknowledge that. Right. Um, and so, but, but then again, I'm also realistic about the fact that if you're feeling yourself off of liver glycogen, 
that's not going to last very long. You're going to have to eat often, and there's a trade-off there. So personally, I really prefer, I love not being tied to food. I love the fact that I can skip breakfast, I can skip lunch. I mean, like, you know, the other day at work, I didn't have, I didn't eat breakfast. I didn't have time to eat lunch. I just worked, you know, I think I worked 12 hours without eating a thing, and I barely even notice. It's no problem. And compared to the way I used to be, it feels like a superpower. And, um, you know, and, and then I, I, so I think there are huge benefits to the low carb side of things and the low carb haters, you know, of course will say, well, it's all about calories and they're technically right. And I am going to totally acknowledge that. And, uh, I just think you've got some some benefits on the low carb side. I'm super biased though, I'll admit it. This episode is brought to you by Athletic Greens, the most comprehensive daily nutritional beverage that I have ever tried. Life is stressful, let's face it, and it can be difficult to maintain optimal nutrition while juggling our businesses, our families, everything that we're doing. We have busy schedules, sometimes we're not sleeping well, and we just want to get the maximum amount of nutrients from our food. That's why I found Athletic Greens to be a life-changing nutritional habit. They have this amazing daily all-in-one superfood powder that you can just add to water and mix and it makes a delicious drink. It is the easiest and the most delicious habit that you can add to your daily routine and they really make it easy to get your optimal nutrition in on a daily basis by just giving you one thing with all the best things. I love finding hacks and ways to optimize my nutrition and doing a keto diet or a carnivore diet. Sometimes I don't know if I'm really getting all the nutrients that I possibly can. And I found adding in this beverage in the morning is such a great hack to make sure that I am not missing out on any nutrients. And it has become even more important to me in the last eight months. I really love athletic greens because it actually tastes delicious. You just add one scoop of athletic greens to a glass of water it has 75 vitamins, minerals from whole food sourced ingredients, and it has a multivitamin, multimineral, probiotic, greens, superfood blend, and more. And they all work together to fill any nutritional gaps in the diet to increase energy and focus and help with digestion, which supports a healthy immune system. I really have found it to be so helpful for digestion, keeping me regular, having a probiotic and a multivitamin all in one makes it so so easy athletic greens obsessively improves their one holistic formula based on the latest research and they have produced 53 different versions over the last decade and they are continually working on a new version all of the time they invest in the most absorbable and natural sources of each ingredient and they go above and beyond in third-party testing which you guys know is so important to me to ensure that customers continue to receive the highest quality and best daily nutritional habit on the planet Right now, Athletic Greens is doubling down on supporting your immune system. They are offering my audience a free one-year supply of vitamin D and five free travel packs with your first purchase if you visit my link today. You'll basically never have to buy vitamin D. Covering your bases with Athletic Greens makes investing in your energy, immunity, and gut health simple, tasty, and efficient. You can just visit athleticgreens.com slash ketogenic girl and join health experts, athletes, and health conscious girls go-getters around the world who make a daily commitment to their health every day. Again, just visit athleticgreens.com slash ketogenic girl and get your free year supply of vitamin D and five free travel packs today. Try it out and let me know how you like it. Well, I think you really hit it on the nail on the head when you said your quality of life really improved from being low carb. And I think another great point you brought up is that you know, when you eat low carb, it seems that you just naturally err more towards less processed foods. And that tends to be because, you know, protein and fat, it is, it's less, it's more real food that you have to cook and prepare as opposed mm-hmm. to, you know, convenience type foods. Um, what I like to see though, is a merging of both because we have focused so much on, you know, energy Um, the energy equation, energy in versus energy out and energy balance. But there's this whole world of endocrine um, theory of of weight loss and 
and optimizing health and body composition that has to do with our hormones and hormone signaling that's been ignored. And now I don't see why they have to be mutually exclusive. It seems that they both together really give us optimal kind of theories when it comes to, to all of this stuff is understanding like, yes, calories matter, but also the kind of calories matter too, in terms of how they signal in the body. And, you know, we talk about protein and fat and how those are the building blocks for so many of our body's tissues. And um, I'm curious, do you think that going back to protein um, and, and the leverage, protein leverage, satiety leverage or protein leverage satiety, <laughs> I always get confused on how you say it. Um, does it have to do, in your opinion at all, with the fact that protein has our essential amino acids and fat has essential fatty acids in it and fat soluble vitamins. So those, those containing those essentials make them, you know, our essential macronutrients as opposed to carbohydrates, which are non-essential basically. Right, right. Yeah. So I, I definitely look at like, what is it you absolutely have to have? So your, your biggest requirement, well, you do have to have some energy. Okay. That's, that's non-negotiable for sure. But beyond that, our biggest requirement in terms of nutrients is definitely protein. Like if you just look at the mass of how much you have to eat that you absolutely have to have every day, protein is definitely the biggest one. So protein is the largest by unit of mass amount of nutrient that you have to have every day. And I think that's one of the reasons why protein drives satiety so much. The, the minerals that you need, the quantity is pretty low. Essential fats that you need, the quantity is actually very low. It's, you know, maybe a couple dozen grams of essential fatty acids that you have to eat every day. It's lower than a lot of people think. Um, I'm, not, I don't, I'm not recommending low-fat diets, but it's true that the absolute quantity of essential fatty acids that you need on a daily basis is pretty low. So the, the biggest requirement we have by far and away is protein. The, the other thing that um, I want to point out is that you kind of have three energy compartments in your body. You have a protein compartment, which is your lean mass in your bone and your muscle, which you can actually use for energy if you have to, and you will if you're starving to death. So there's the protein compartment of your body there is the fat compartment of your body, and then there's the glucose um, storage compartment of your body, which is ultra tiny. And if you look at the really big picture, and I know I keep saying this, but I like I try to do that a lot. If you look at the big picture, you're trying to get, for optimum health, you want the highest lean mass you can achieve at the lowest fat mass. That will give you the very best um, you know, insulin sensitivity and metabolic flexibility and strength and probably longevity and health and all of these things sort of align. So the higher you get protein, literally the higher your lean mass is going to be. You can increase your lean mass just by eating a higher protein percentage, even if you don't do anything else. And then of course, all of the energy you're eating just expands your fat mass, basically. So um, that's one more reason why the protein to energy ratio kind of checks all the boxes. You know what I mean? You're trying to get the highest lean mass at the lowest fat mass. So you're eating the most protein at the lowest energy. And then uh, the, to sort of answer your question, yes, I definitely think that protein gives you the most satiety because it's our largest absolute requirement in terms of nutrients on a daily basis. Right. Now, what do you, do you take into account protein turnover at all? You know, when I was, you know, studying biochemistry and, and sports medicine, I saw that there were, there's quite a bit of protein turnover. Um, mm -hmm. I've seen figures as high as 300 to 14 grams per day. Mm -hmm. uh, so do you take that into account as, at all? Well, yeah, everyone's turning over hundreds of grams of protein a day. And I know that you can get by without eating protein for a really, really long time. You know, we, we have these reports of people fasting for super long periods of time and not eating any protein. The question is whether that's optimal. Right. You know what I mean? That's possible, but it's not. I don't know that that's optimal. I don't think we have any evidence that that is optimal. So the really, really, really low protein diets scare me, whether they're 
uh, keto low protein diets or the raw fruitarian low protein diets on either side. I'm scared by these diets. I think that's probably a bad idea. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, I, I, I think that the, the other thing about protein turnover is the people who need the most protein are in the worst metabolic shape. Like type two diabetics just chew through tons of protein. These people have a higher protein requirement th than the rest of us. In fact, the, like if you look at some young, lean, healthy, ripped bodybuilder with great insulin sensitivity, that person actually has the lowest protein requirement. You know, they might be able to get by with a, you know, 90 grams of protein a day. But uh, your obese uh, diabetic, type 2 diabetic person is actually going to have a higher protein requirement. Um, and, and interestingly enough, on a practical level, they probably have to eat more protein to get satiety as well. And that might be for a really good reason. So that's just one more reason for these people to target the hell out of protein. So I just, I want to cry when I see some people in poor metabolic health who are trying to shave back their protein grams just because they, something about something, blah, 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 insulin or glucose, I'm going to eat less protein. It makes me want to cry. It's just terrible. Right. They're afraid of signaling mTOR or um, getting a, a uh, an insulin spike. Um, now, related to that, what do you think is the optimal amount of protein for someone to be sort of targeting, you know, if protein is the goal every day? Right. So I like to target uh, roughly a gram per pound of desired body weight or ideal body weight or reference body weight or what you should weigh for your height. So for example, I'm 5'10 and males should weigh uh, 110 pounds for the first five feet and then five pounds for every inch over that. So I should weigh 160 pounds. Um, and I I do weigh about 160 pounds. So my target is 160 grams of protein a day as sort of a minimum. And sometimes I'll go up to 1.25 grams per pound per day, which is about 200 grams for me. So I'm eating 160 to 200 grams of protein a day. And I think that's a really good target for most people. And that's my advice to pretty much everyone I see is to target a gram per pound of desired or ideal body weight. For women, you should weigh 100 pounds for the first five feet and then five pounds for every additional inch over that. So if you're five foot four, you should weigh 120 pounds, for example. So you'd target 120 grams of protein minimum, maybe a little bit over that. And do you look, do you have a sort of optimal idea for fat or other macros? Yeah, so if you're, I think if you're in a very low carb diet, and you're at maintenance, you'd probably eat equal grams of protein and fat. But if you're at all trying to lower your body fat percentage, you should have your fat grams way lower than your protein grams daily. Like my goal personally is to have uh, fat grams lower than protein grams every single day. Like there's almost no days where I eat higher fat grams than protein grams. So for, so for me, protein might be 160 to 200 grams. Fat might be 100 grams. I'm, I might eat considerably lower fat grams. If you're really, really cutting, you might want to eat half the fat grams that you eat in protein daily. And uh, this is... Um, this is, you know, what every single bodybuilder and bikini model and fitness model and aesthetic athlete out there is doing, and it works extremely well. And I think what people don't understand is that gets you the very healthiest as well. These You get extremely low fasting insulin levels and blood sugars and A1Cs and triglycerides and all these metrics just get ultra low the leaner you get. And you do that and you sustain it with a higher protein percentage diet. So your macro ratio usually is like one to one for maintenance and kind of optimizing body composition and then tweaking that depending on if your goal is like fat loss, for example, is that about right? Correct. Like, so if you're eating no carbs, for example, which I don't recommend, but if you were, then it would be a gram per pound of protein or higher 
uh, equal grams of fat for maintenance and half the grams of fat for extreme cutting or somewhere in between for a little bit more sustained weight loss. Okay, so I'm gonna challenge you a little bit on the protein thing. Now, I have been observing this whole carnivore trend coming up. I am, I'm sort of carnivore-ish personally. Um, one of the things that I've seen is sometimes, like I'm in a lot of sort of carnivore groups and I kind of been observing for a couple of years like how people do it and what people recommend in the groups. And like there's quite a spectrum across the board. One thing that I do see sometimes is people who are doing, you know, their foray into low carb is going this route and they're doing like four to five pounds of meat in a day and they're super sedentary, not working out and just really low activity levels and probably don't have huge like lean mass to, you know, fat ratio in the body. So at some point when you look at biochemistry, isn't that, putting a person back in a glycolytic state where even though they are zero carb, even that the body has to take that protein. I know you say that you cringe when you see like excess protein or that kind of thing, but is there an infinite amount of protein that people can eat? Because if someone takes it that way, then couldn't they just be creating tons of glucose? So uh, for the most part, if you eat more protein than you need, uh, you deaminate it, you strip off the nitrogen, and then you oxidize the carbon skeletons in your mitochondria, just like you would burn fat or carbs or anything else. So it doesn't necessarily have to be converted to glucose or raise your blood sugar at all. So I'm not really afraid of that. If someone's eating four or five pounds of meat, I'm more afraid of how much fat they're getting in that meat to be totally honest. Like if you ate four or five pounds of chicken breast, I'm not too worried about that. But if you're eating four or five pounds of ribeye, you're, you're going to be really hype, hyper caloric. And then you're probably not going to be, you, you're, you're not going to hit your goals. I'm guessing, you know what I mean? Interesting. Oh, okay. I didn't think about it that way. Um, that you, yeah, whenever you're eating meat, you're basically getting the fat that comes with it. So that's, that's interesting. Yeah, and I, and I have to go on a tiny rant about just like meat and insulin for, for a second because everyone's like, wow, protein raises your insulin and uh, it, protein could convert to glucose and that could raise your insulin and blah, 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 something about insulin. What people don't realize is the biggest driver by a, just a tsunami landslide, the biggest driver of the amount of insulin you experience every day is just walking around being overweight. So you just have this massive wall of basal insulin if you're over fat. And anything you do with your diet doesn't even matter. It's a drop in the bucket compared to just being too fat so like if i'm you know 20 pounds overweight and it's all abdominal and i my waist circumference is way higher than it should be you know my fasting insulin <clears throat> might be a, a five or a 10 or a 20 or a 30 or 40 56 i see uh, you know 70 80 90 fasting insulin after i eat it could go up to several hundreds and you're just a wash in insulin anything that makes you thinner is going to cut your insulin exposure way, 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 way down. I mean, I, you know, usually my fasting insulin levels of one. Yeah, well, and I was going to say, how do you get perfect? <laughs> so, so, and, and you could, you could do that on a high carb diet. You could be a low fat, high carb uh, person, as long as you're, you have a very well formulated diet, plenty of protein and micronutrients. Uh, yes, you're going to have the downsides of high car, higher carb diet, frequent eating, blah blah blah. But if you can get really, really lean and stay there from the satiety on a high carb diet, your everyday insulin exposure is going to be way, way lower. Just because you're thin has nothing to do with 
you know, eating carbs versus eating protein versus eating fat. So the whole low carb community gets a little bit stuck on the fact that carbohydrate raises insulin so much. Yes, it does. And what that does is displace fat oxidation. That makes you more glucose dependent. And then you have to eat more frequently. Um, but if you can just get thinner somehow, your overall basal insulin goes down so much that it almost doesn't matter. The uh, probably, so, okay, picture this. Let's say you just ate a thousand pounds of butter, right? Now, butter, uh, we all know it doesn't raise insulin at all. That's why it's like this free food. You can, what's that? I'm pretty sure it raises it some, right? Like all foods stimulate some insulin. Well, what 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 fat does is it 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 takes so long to it it's not really insulinogenic much at all, which is true. But let's say you eat your thousand pounds of butter, and this fat is going to eventually um, make its way into your adipocytes and expand them all slightly and boom now you're slightly more insulin resistant you just walk around with a higher basal insulin at all times so you've really increased your insulin exposure in a 24-hour period the area under the curve a lot with fat um, even though it didn't acutely spike anything the way carbs do you know so if you ate um if you ate a bunch of sugar and then went for a jog and burned it all off. You're, you're going to end up with the same insulin exposure as if you just ate fat and then had higher basal insulin for the next day or two. And, and so I'm really pushing back on the low carb world's focus on carbs and insulin. You know what I mean? It's not that I, I do. I'm a low carb fan. I blame carbohydrate for a big chunk of the obesity epidemic, right? I, uh, but I don't want people to think that the reason carbs are evil is because they immediately spike your insulin because you're also getting these insulin elevations if you're just overweight, you know what I'm saying? Okay. Rant ends. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, I love a good rant, like rant away. Um, I think it's so great. Now, ranting and, and all this controversy creates dialogue and it helps us grow and learn, right? Um, and speaking of that, of controversial statements, there are doctors out there, doctors like Dr. Ron Rosedale, who are very big advocates of keeping protein low. And they say it's because too much protein signals mTOR, and you're actually better off doing high carb than high protein because at the end of the day, your body's going to have to sequester that nitrogen and deal with it and it you know it's so toxic it has to go to the liver and all this what's your opinion when you hear statements like that so I, i'm looking at um sort of lifespan versus health span you know what i mean so the theory is that you might be able to extend your lifespan with protein restriction uh, of course there's no data at all in humans or really any higher organisms to support this in the slightest. So we don't, we don't have evidence for this in humans at all. Um, it's all theoretical. Protein restriction will give you lower lean mass. You will have less strength. You'll have less bone density. You'll have less muscle mass. And we have so much epidemiological data that the stronger you are, the longer you're going to live. The more muscle mass you have, the longer you're going to live. You really want the most lean mass you can get. And you're, on your low protein, protein restricted diet, you're not gonna have a lot of lean mass. And I think that's gonna lower your health span. And even if you, let's, nobody's gonna live over 120. You know, we're just not gonna see that in the next couple generations. I really don't think so. And even if somebody pulled it off, the quality of life of those extra years is gonna be, you know, basically worthless. So, I'm all about the health span. Let's just try to maximize that, right? And there's zero evidence that protein restriction is going to increase health span. And there's quite a bit of evidence that protein restriction will worsen health span. So I'm not buying it. I mean, I love Dr. Rosedale. Like, this guy's awesome. Yeah. I have his book. I love Rosedale. I love the dialogue. I love thinking about all this stuff. But somebody's going to have to show me at least a little bit of evidence that protein restriction improves health span in humans. And so far, I haven't seen it. So 
what is your take on the debate between the protein and fat ratios? Just my last question on that. When you see certain protocols that are, you know, like the paleo medicine and protocol is very popular for certain, a certain percentage of the population that they focus in on, uh, and they have a ratio of two to one fat to protein. So what's your opinion on that? Well, part of it is it's a little bit artificial looking at absolute protein to energy ratios because it all depends on your activity level, right? Like if I'm training for a marathon and I'm running, you know, 10 miles a day, my protein to energy ratio is going to be less than, I mean, it's going to be, I'm going to eat more than two grams of fat to every one gram of protein. I might eat three to one or four to one. I might get my protein energy ratio down to the standard American diet if I'm expending enough energy uh, with exercise and activity. So some of it's kind of artificial. Um, the, if, you're, if your energy expenditure is super high, your protein to energy ratio could be anywhere. And that's why the PE ratio, uh, I never really look at absolutes. It's just where are you at and where do you want to be and what should you do to your protein to energy ratio to get there. So for example, if you're on the Paleo Medicina, two grams of fat to one gram protein, but you're over fat, there's too much fat in your body, okay, I would suggest raising your PE ratio to some degree. Try, maybe try a one-to-one -one or just anything that's even slightly higher. Just trade out some of your um, fat grams for protein grams to see if increasing it will make you thinner. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So I don't really like to look at absolutes like, oh, everyone should eat <clears throat> two to one or one to one or one to two or any of those, because it doesn't really matter. It all depends on your activity level, where you're at. My, the only thing I'm saying is if you're not where you want to be, maybe you should aim a little higher on a PE ratio. Right. And I just don't see how anybody can necessarily argue with that. So, uh, but I, but I acknowledge the fact that there are a lot of people out there who found that they have higher satiety on higher fat grams. And guess what? So do I. The more fat I eat, the more satiety I have. I don't know if that's going to get me the leanest. And mm -hmm. so when I see somebody getting extremely lean and extremely low insulin levels on these, um, on a diet by just dumping in way, way more fat, okay, then I'll start um, being really interested in what's going on there. Excellent. Now, what's your opinion on nose to tail and eating organ meats? So I, I love nose to tail. Um, in the book, I have this sort of joke of a diagram about the amoeba diet, where you're just basically uh -huh. engulfing entire organisms in their entirety, entire animals and entire plants. And I think when you, when you ingest an entire other living organism, you get the absolute best um, macros and micros, and that's the way to go. So I love eating an entire other organism. Personally, I do that with eggs and fish and seafood and shellfish um, rather than organ meats. Like, for example, I've never eaten uh, beef, liver, or kidney, or any of these organs in my entire life. Like, never once. I've literally never even had a liver. Out. Yes. So I, so I'm, I'm pulling it off. I think with eggs and fish yeah. and shellfish, but I do love the nose to tail idea, and I think attempting to do that is good. And I, you know, who knows? I might be even way better off if I did eat liver. So I'm very open minded to the fact that it's probably awesome. I'm just not doing it, so I don't want to be a hypocrite. No, I totally get that. I'm like, I just love, love, love organ meats liver pate beef heart chicken hearts like i just i find it so delicious um mm -hmm. feel amazing but i love just your emphasis on and you can do that like you said with eggs with you know caviar with fish roe with oysters there's so many mm -hmm. other things you can do that with um one thing that i wanted to ask you about is nutrient extraction um because i've heard people say that it's higher from raw foods and yet I've also heard you say that it's higher when food is cooked and that's sort of what has precipitated our evolution and uh you know is is cooking food and and making is that 
because the nutrients are more available? I think for the most part, cooking food uh, is a good way to increase the bioavailability of most nutrients and also get rid of a lot of toxins. So you're going to kill parasites and you're going to denature some plant toxins. And so I think just overall on the whole, cooking gives you a little bit more good and a little bit less bad. And that's why I think humans are cucinivores, which we basically, we process and cook our food intentionally. Once again, using technology to maximize the nutrient yield and minimize the toxin load. And so I, I'm a big fan of cooking. I like cooked. I think overall cooking is better than not cooking. I do think that on an individual like vitamin basis, you will see some vitamins actually getting denatured by the cooking process. So if, if you just strictly measure the folate in your raw spinach versus your cooked spinach, it's actually going to maybe go down a little bit. Um, so on a nutrient by nutrient basis, cooking might actually make some of them lower. Uh, but if you just on balance, look at all foods on, on, on the whole, I think cooking is net positive. So, you know, sometimes I'll eat uh, some things raw here and there, but uh, for the most part, I'm cooking everything. And do you do any supplementing with electrolytes? I know you have a big emphasis on minerals. So do you supplement it all with sodium? Nope, never. So like I've never, ever, ever, ever taken magnesium or calcium or potassium or made myself drink salt water. I never bother with any of that crap. And I know that it's probably good and some people benefit from it. And I, I'm just here to say you don't have to do that, right? Part of my whole approach is like minimum effective dose of exercise and just the what can you get by with and and uh, and and part of that for me is okay can i pull this off without any supplements or micromanaging electrolytes and the answer is absolutely yes nobody on earth has to be taking a potassium supplement nobody on earth has to be making themselves drink more salt you just don't have to do those things and uh, in the interest of keeping it as just absolutely simple as possible, I just salt my food to taste and move on. So you do supplement with salt. <laughs> right. Yes, I do. I have a salt. Uh, I, I do use salt and I'm super fussy. I like, you know, kosher salt. And uh, so I guess that's technically a supplement. Now, I love how much you emphasize the minimum effective dose, especially when it comes to exercise. And I love how you emphasize calisthenics. So do you talk about that? Let's talk about your book a bit, how I love my copy of it. I'm so excited for you guys. Congratulations on releasing it. And I'd love to give people an idea of what they could expect from the book. Do you talk about exercise in there? What can we look for, look out for from you on that? Gotcha. Okay. So in the book, well, basically the, the idea is that you're never going to get to your body composition goals without exercise ever. You're also not going to get the metabolic flexibility that you want without exercise. So for example, you know, I have diabetics who can be in remission without exercise. Now their sugar might be normal. Their A1C is normal. But two problems. First of all, they really have to white knuckle it on the diet side just to get by because they're not leveraging exercise at all. And secondly, they, if they eat a bunch of carbs, their blood sugar just goes through the roof. So they're really not metabolically flexible and they're really not quote unquote cured. And you can kind of only do that by having more muscle mass and depleting glycogen in your muscles regularly. And you do that with high intensity exercise, resistance and cardio. And so in the book, we talk about the fact that humans are hardwired not to exercise. Your body tries to conserve every bit of energy it can just to keep you alive during the winter time or whatever. You don't know where your next meal is coming from. You have to stay alive. We're naturally hardwired to eat the most energy and expend the least energy. And so you actually have to fight that biology big time to exercise. So the, for that reason, the volume of exercise in our book is tiny. I mean, you're talking, you can do, a, 
you know, we have a nano workout in the book that you can do in seven minutes, but oh, the idea is <laughs> exactly. You're just putting the highest tension you can in every muscle chain in your body, push, pull legs. You're maxing out the tension, highest tension for the longest amount of time you can with simple body weight moves like push-ups, pull-ups, squats, and then some sort of high intensity cardio intervals like jump squats or something. And if you're really focused and you get the intensity high enough, you can do a workout in just a couple of minutes. Uh, that's, you know, most people aren't exercising at all because one, they don't have time and two, they're not inclined to, it's, it's, it's against our nature. So I think the way around that is to just be super focused, the minimum effective dose, the smallest amount you can get by with. And that's really what I've been exploring on my whole exercise journey is how little can I do and still get by, you know? So I just, I never work out more than 15 minutes. It's super focused. It's super high intensity, but in, out, done kind of thing. You know what I mean? And we, we discuss all of that in the book. Sounds like you're working out smarter instead of, you know, just working out more. Uh, I exactly. It's, it's smarter and then less. Now, Schufelt, my co-author, he loves the gym. So I think he's spending mm -hmm. a lot more time working out. He's also using weights and stuff like that, although he does do calisthenics as well. I'm over here trying to trying to do it without any equipment or any anything. You know what I mean? Uh, once again, I'm like trying to be a minimalist. Can I do it with no time, no equipment, no money, no nothing? Um, and the answer is yes. I just love that so much because I think for people to have this idea in their head that they can just do something every day at home as opposed to having to get a gym membership, getting workout clothes, going to the gym, like all those mirrors to do with, like the pressure of other people who look fit, like it's a huge deterrent to working out. And if there's things that you can do at home, like I know I do my squats just to failure. Like I learned that from a lot of the information you've put out there. And I noticed, wow, like today I got to a hundred and then I couldn't even do like 30 before. And it's all about that signaling. Like you're saying, you're signaling to the body, like you got to adapt. So the next time we do this, it's easier. And that just makes so much sense. It's a really brilliant concept. Mm -hmm. Cool. Thank you. That's awesome. That's great. That's perfect. That's exactly what we're trying to do. I have to ask you one last question on protein and what's in the book with regards to diet and sort of guidelines and stuff, but I need to know, do you differentiate between amino acids and different types of proteins? Like, do you talk about that at all in the book? Are some better than others? I know that you're probably saying, well, that goes against my whole simplicity um, approach, but you know, I know some people get into the amino acids and different, are some proteins better than others? Well, there, we have two just general concepts. The first one being that animal protein is always of a higher quality and more bioavailable than plant protein. And that's just because anything at a higher trophic level is going to concentrate nitrogen. So, you know, the, the plant can only suck up a certain amount of nitrogen from the soil because it's limited by its roots. But your cow can walk around and eat, you know, a hundred different plants and it concentrates and bioaccumulates all of this nitrogen. So you have way higher protein and mineral density in an animal food than a plant food. And we talk about that in the book. So plant, plant protein is unfortunately inferior to animal protein just because it's at a lower trophic level. Um, we also talk about if you eat an entire organism, an entire animal or an entire plant, you're going to get every single thing you need to make and sustain life. And so that's always going to be a nice blend and a nice balance. But we definitely don't get into specific amino acids. That's like way too complicated. I don't think anybody, nobody needs to make it that complicated. That's just, right. I mean, we could, but it would just really not be value added because you're just going to massively overcomplicate things. And I'm trying to dumb it down. I mean, I'm trying to make this as accessible as possible. And that's the, the last thing I want people to do is have to worry about which amino acids they're getting. If you could put one thing on a billboard for the whole world to see, what would it say? Ooh, get out of your comfort zone. Oh, nice. Yeah. 
yeah, yeah people need to, uh, you really want to push yourself out of your comfort zone every day. You want to put the highest tension in all of your muscles that you can, even if it's briefly, um, that's uncomfortable as hell. You want to be, uh, wait, don't eat until you're really, really actually hungry. It's extremely uncomfortable. Um, max out your heart rate, very uncomfortable. Uh, let yourself get cold and then try to stay warm. Uncomfortable. You, you, you really want to push yourself way out of your comfort zone when it comes to making your own glucose and feeling cold and feeling hungry and feeling tension in all your muscles. And nobody does any of this stuff because we don't like to be even the slightest bit uncomfortable for any length of time. And so we all just sit in our hover chairs all day long and uh, suck down glucose. And uh, so it would be get out of your comfort zone. I love the reference to Wally because mm-hmm. that's what I always think about um, I <laughs> wanting to avoid that. I know your book is going to have a huge impact on helping us avoid that, but what is your vision and legacy for yourself in the world? Oh, wow. Well, wow. so I'm just trying to, I'm trying to break down and decode the bare minimums for diet and exercise and make it accessible to everybody. I'm like, this This is what you need for diet and exercise for optimum health. And it's really simple. And it's basically just muscular tension, steak and eggs, and don't eat carbs all day long. And uh, I, I could have fit the whole book on one page. In fact, in there, we did fit the whole book on one page. And that's what I'm trying to do is just make it so, so, so simple. Awesome. Awesome. Well, your book is amazing. I am so excited to share the link here. Where can people follow you and find more from you and find the book? Okay. All right. Well, the book is at thepediet.com. That's P-E as in protein energy, thepediet.com. And it's also on iBooks and Kindle. And uh, you can check me out. I'm on Twitter at Ted Naiman. I have a, a website and a Facebook group called Burn Fat, Not Sugar. And uh, probably the best way to get a, interact with me is on Twitter, but I'm on all the socials, Instagram and that kind of thing. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for being here with us today, Dr. Naiman. I really, really appreciate your time, all your knowledge and expertise, and just for all the amazing free information and resources that you put out there for people. It really is making a big difference. Oh, well, thank you so much. And I love your podcast. I love what you're doing. So stay awesome. Thank you. All right, you guys, thank you so much for tuning in to the very first episode of this protein series coming to you on Thursdays. From now on, it's going to run for several weeks and it's just going to be bringing you the very best episodes on protein, protein to fat, protein leverage, and all of that because I know so many of you listeners are super interested in this topic. And uh, it's great to just expand our knowledge and information that we have about protein and how it works and all the different amino acids and functions and leucine and muscle protein synthesis. It all helps us to get better body composition at the end of the day. So hope you guys enjoyed this episode. If you ever have a moment to leave me a rating or review on iTunes, it is the best way to support this show. And it really means so much to me. I really am so thankful to all of you who've left amazing ratings and reviews and to any one of you who takes a moment to do that. Uh, thank you so, so much. Thank you guys for listening. If you want to try out keto or higher protein versions of keto with me coaching and guiding you, you can go to ketogenicgirl.com and you will find all of my meal plans there and they all come with support and coaching from me in our members Facebook group. So I would love to have you join and help you get to your goals. All right, you guys, that's all for now. I can't wait to catch you on the next episode. And until then, wishing you a fat field rest of your day. Bye for now. And thanks for listening. A few disclaimers. By listening to this podcast, you agree not to use this podcast as medical advice as I am not a qualified healthcare provider. The information presented on this podcast is for educational purposes only. Ketogenic Girl is not qualified to provide medical advice. Consult your own physician for any medical issues that you may be having. This entire disclaimer also applies to any guests or contributors to this podcast. Prior to beginning a ketogenic diet, you should undergo a full health screening with your physician to confirm that a keto diet is suitable for you and to rule out any conditions or contraindications that may pose risks or that are incompatible with a ketogenic diet. 
A keto diet may or may not be appropriate for you if you have any kind of health condition, whether known to you or unknown. So you must consult your physician to find this out. Anyone under the age of 18 should consult with their physician and their parents or legal guardians.